Madonna. Hello. How's everybody doing today? All right. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about compilers and why I think they're at the core of the next evolution of web performance. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Chad Hytella. I'm a senior staff software engineer at LinkedIn, where I get to work on a bunch of open source JavaScript infrastructure that help power LinkedIn's applications. I'm also part of the EmberJS core team, where I help maintain and work on different uh, libraries and frameworks within the, the Ember ecosystem. If you have any questions about LinkedIn, or Ember, come find me after my talk. But before we jump into my talk, we first have to have a baseline understanding of what actually is a compiler. Um, and I think this topic can be rather intimidating for a lot of people because it's associated with things like computer science and theory, and not everybody has a background in those things. So when I think about a compiler and what it is at a high level, what it really is is that it's really just a code translator. It's gonna take some source code in, the compiler is going to transform it in various different ways, and what you're going to get as output is another executable program. So, for instance, in the browser, you can write something like this, a super simple add one function. And what the browser has to do before it can actually execute this function is parse and compile it into something that's much more low level, something that can actually run on top of a CPU. And it's the browser's ability to do this just-in-time just compilation that has made the web a viable platform for building very sophisticated applications. But I'm not actually here today to talk about these compilers. I'm here to talk about the compilers that we use every single day inside of our tool chains. And we've actually been using compilers for quite a long period of time, about 15 years or so, maybe a little bit more. And so we're gonna quickly look through kind of the history of compilers in the front end tooling space and what they've afforded us in terms of like performance or developer ergonomics. So we first have to go back to 2003 when Douglas Crocker writes JSMIN. And JSMIN is a one file uh, C, C library that just removed all the meaningless white space from your JavaScript code and things like comments and stuff like that. And this drastically shrunk the size of the applications that we were shipping to the browser. Right along the same period of time, YUI compressor comes out. And why YUI compressor has this very similar type of goals. It wants to reduce the size of the JavaScript that's being sent over the wire. And it does things like removing less meaningless white space and removing comments. But it introduces the notion of mangling or symbol mangling. And it goes something like this. So this is a uniquing function, one that you could have written in uh, 2003. This is like valid ES3 code. Um, and so what the compiler is gonna do is that it's gonna pull out all of the user identify, or user uh, specified identifiers. So this is unique, R, ret, I, item. And what the compiler does is it maps them onto a set of new identifiers, in this case, A, B, C, D, and E. And it can do this because the compiler has all the lexical and semantic information inside of it. So it knows that it safely can remap this thing that you wrote into something that is much smaller. And so while in 2018, this is not like a new novel idea, uh, anybody that's building JavaScript applications is going through a minification step. But at the time, this was rather novel, um, and it sped up applications quite a bit. Next comes this period from 2003 to through 2008, and not a whole lot happens during this time in terms of like developer tool chains and everything like that. And that's because this is the life and death of ES4. And so for those who are familiar with what ES4 is or was, uh, it was an actual specification of JavaScript that never actually shipped. Um, but looking back at ES4 today, we would actually say that ES4 has shipped because it specified things like classes, module system, generators, iterators, destructuring assignment, all the things that we're using today uh, inside of our applications. But Mind you, this is, developers wanted these types of features from the language back then. And this is also when Google comes out with uh, Google Maps and kind of shows the types of things that we can build, it, build for the web and we can be a little bit more ambitious um, in terms of the applications that we want to build there. So next comes this period from 2008 to 2010. 
And what do we see during this period of time? Well, we actually see like an explosion of compilers enter uh, the tooling space. And I actually like to call this period of time the enlightenment. It's kind of like the origin story of where we are today uh, from a tooling perspective. So we have projects like Cappuccino, GWT, and CoffeeScript that are all kind of birthed out of the sentiment that they no longer want to be beholden to the standardization process. So in the case of Cappuccino, they create Objective-J, which is a dialect of Objective-C. GWT bo bothers, uh, borrows Java, and CoffeeScript kind of takes the best parts of Python and Ruby to create a new language. And what all these projects kind of have in common is that they are their own language, and they built sophisticated compilers uh, in between there to turn that, that language into JavaScript code that could run in the browser of, of the time. And so this allowed them to do things like shed away runtime libraries for doing things like class systems. But the big idea here is that JavaScript is effectively a bytecode format. You don't actually have to write in the programming language of the web as long as you can build a sophisticated enough compiler that maps the, la the language that you wrote in onto the semantics of uh, the JavaScript language. The other thing that comes out during this period of time is more advanced minifiers. So this is Clojure Compiler, and Clojure Compiler is pretty unique. So let's say you have some JavaScript code in your application like this. This is very silly code, but in a large enough application you will end up having code like this, uh, even if you try really hard. Uh, so we can see that like predicate is never actually getting reassigned, so the first conditional is always gonna execute, the second conditional is never gonna execute, and then we have this do stuff uh, function declaration here where we're just summing left and right and we've left off callback. And on the last line we're doing some type of string interpolation, uh, string con interpolation or concatenation uh, type of thing. So if you give this code to a closure compiler, what you get out of it is something like this. So not only has it minified the code, it has done a whole lot more. So the closure compiler can figure out that this first branch is always gonna execute, so just inline the body of the conditional. The second conditional was never gonna execute, so just throw it away. Um, and then the interesting part here is that do stuff just doesn't exist. So closure compiler has this technique in it known as constant folding, where it can see if calls to the function are gonna be side effect free, it can just do that work in ahead of time and just inline the result. It's also done the same thing with A and B here where it is just concaten concaten them into the string because there is no observable side effects. And so because Clojure Compiler takes in your entire application and produces this more optimal subset of the code, what we'd actually call Clojure Compiler is an optimizing compiler. It's a really cool piece of technology and it's still used today on a lot of web properties. And so that brings us to today. And I think today we have like really great tools. We have Webpack, we have Rollup, we had Tracer for some period of time, but like Babel has kind of superseded it in, in the transpilation space. And so what are those tools doing? Well, they're actually building off the backs that things, uh, of the things that came before it. So in the case, uh, they allow you to use like new language features, which kind of harkens back to the sentiment of like the objective J's and uh, the coffee scripts of the world. They can do more optimized code bundles. They can do different forms of dead co code elimination. So this is like scope hoisting and tree shaking. And so you'd think in 2018, we're kind of like pinnacle of uh, performance here. We've had 15 years of really sophisticated tool chains being developed. Uh, so everything is great, right? Well, I'd actually say that there are quite a few problems uh, in what we do today. And I think that's because we've kind of fundamentally changed on how we approach to building applications for the web. And so this is a tweet by Alex Russell, who is a developer on the Chrome team. He also might be some of your guys' colleagues. Um, and what he says is the web is getting slower because no matter how much faster we make Chrome, developers abuse users with ever larger piles of JavaScript, and JavaScript is the most expensive thing. So let me unpack this uh, a little bit. So I think about five years ago, we kind of shifted quite drastically on how we approach building web applications. We used to start with HTML, and then you'd style it with CSS, and then you would layer on the JavaScript to get a little bit of interactivity. And we've basically inverted this world. We start with JavaScript a lot of the times, and we add CSS to it, and HTML is just out of the picture for a lot of applications nowadays. 
And so because we are pushing more and more responsibility onto JavaScript, there tends to be a lot more of it. Um, and we have to ship that down to our users. And what he's talking about in this last part about JavaScript being the most expensive thing is this. It is the parse and compile step of JavaScript that is very, very expensive. So if you think about it, you're writing JavaScript code, it's a textual representation. That code needs to go to the browser and needs to turn into an executable uh, like thing. Like it just doesn't run the text that you wrote. And so in 2017, Adi Asmani wrote a really great blog article called JavaScript Startup Time, and he had this really great graphic in it. And what it's saying is that uh, the bytes of JavaScript are not the same bytes as a JPEG. And so this is on a constrained network and a constrained de device. So if you have 170 KB of anything, it takes roughly the same amount of time to pull it over the wire. So in this case, it takes three and a half seconds to transmit both of these asset types. But once they get onto the device, it's a whole nother ball game. Uh, so in the case of a JPEG, it is binary data, so it just goes through a decoder like pretty quickly, um, and it takes about 70 milliseconds to do that. Whereas the JavaScript takes an additional two seconds for it just to process on the device. And I think this is some of the stuff that uh, both Chris and Malta were talking about uh, two days ago. Um, and then from there, the JavaScript then executes for another uh, one and a half seconds, whereas the JPEG just needs to paint to the screen and takes 0 0.028 uh, mils or 2.8 milliseconds to or seconds to do that. So very different uh, types of resources that we're talking about here. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm on the Ember.js core team, and over the past couple years, I've been working on this project known as the Glimmer VM. And we think about the Glimmer VM as an example of the types of tools that I think that we have to start thinking about building or building to help mitigate some of these inherent problems with uh, JavaScript. And so for those who aren't familiar with what the Glimmer VM is, it is the rendering engine inside of Ember. And this is uh, the San Diego Ember Meetup's uh, mascot, it's pretty cool. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with what it means to build an Ember application, I'm gonna go through a really quick example. So this is your quintessential to-do MVC type of app. So you would have a to-dos component, you would each over each one of the to-dos, every iter iteration of the loop, you're gonna invoke an item component, and you're pass the to-do at that index into the item component. Item component is what we call a template only component. If you're familiar with React or solutions like it, we would call it a pure component. Uh, it just draws from its inputs. And then the backing class for the to-dos component would look something like this. We have a couple different decorators here. Uh, tract is just our mechanism for doing change detection in the system, and action is just binding uh, the instance to uh, basically doing the bind so that when we put it into the template layer, you can just freely pass it around. So this isn't all that important, um, but the important part is that Ember uses templates, and it's one of the largest reasons why it broke away from this other framework, which was known as Sprout Core, which is used to build like things like Mobile Me at Apple. It was to bring this declarative templating language uh, to a framework. And we're not actually alone in this philosophy of having a domain-specific language to declaratively, declaratively describe our views, and something that actually isn't in JavaScript. Both Vue and Angular have, I think, a very s similar philosophy, and Angular actually wrote pretty extensively about why Angular uses templates in 2016. It's a really great blog article. But at the end of the day, even though that Vue and Angular are owning complete languages uh, with their own semantics and their own compiler stacks, at the end of the day, both Vue and Angular still compile the templates to JavaScript. And so it's not really working towards solving this parse and compile prob or problem or just property of uh, JavaScript. So how does Glimmer VM uh, approach this problem? Well, instead of compiling the templates to JavaScript, we actually compile them to a binary executable. Uh, anytime that you're talking about binary, like we have to have the, the matrix background. Um, <coughs> So what does that actually mean? That means if you write a template like this at build time, so this is ahead of time compilation step, we compile that template into a binary blob that encodes all of the instructions to recreate that template at runtime. 
And so you may be saying to yourself, ah, this is like quite novel, but how does it actually help mitigate this parse and compile problem? Well, binary data in the browser is, can be represented by an API known as a typed array. Uh, if you go find the documentation for a typed array, you'll come across this great definition that says, a typed array is a slab of memory with a type view into it, much like how arrays work in C. Because a typed array is backed by raw memory, the JavaScript engine can pass that memory directly to native libraries without having to painstakingly convert the data into a native representation. So what it's talking about in that last part is parse and compile. With typed arrays and the data inside of them, they never actually see the parse and compile pipeline of JavaScript. So that's a pretty cool property of them. So if we look at open source, Java, uh, open source Ember applications and even internal applications, what we tend to find is anywhere from 25 to 40% of these applications are built up of this templating layer. And so if we can take those templates and compile them into something that isn't JavaScript, that doesn't have these inherent parse and compile, uh, um, not issues, but it's just the reality of the world, then what we can do is we can actually speed up applications. So how do we actually do this? We're gonna kind of walk through kind of a quick example of how both the compilation part works and then how we actually execute that code at runtime. So valid HTML uh, in handlebars templates is valid, a valid template, so we're gonna use this super simple hello world-esque uh, example to kind of walk through the process. So the first thing that we're actually gonna do is we're gonna take that template and we're gonna tokenize it into an abstract syntax tree, and then it's gonna get passed through a couple different compiler stages, um, and at the end of the day, what you're gonna get out of this phase is something that looks like this. So we started with this declarative templating layer, um, and now what we get is like this JSON that is very declarative. Uh, it kind of looks like the message format that uh, the worker DOM uses. And so this is JSON, this isn't actually binary, so we actually have to further compile this format down. And that's where the opcode compiler comes in. Um, before we actually jump into what the role of the opcode compiler is, let me unpack some terminology. So an opcode is just a number. Uh, a number that is significant to a virtual machine that is tied to some level or a small bit of functionality. So you can think of it as just a function that is gonna do a little bit of work. And an opcode takes operands, um, and you can think of operands as just arguments to that function. And together, you would call this an instruction. A bytecode set is just many instructions that is encoding where these instructions begin and end. So it's just a bunch of numbers, but those numbers are encoded in a very specific way. So going back to our JSON example, we're gonna start compiling this into uh, that binary format. So the first thing that we do is that we're going to pop uh, each item off of this list. Um, so in this case, we're gonna compile open the open element statement. We're gonna map that, the first element of that array into a method of the same name. So open element maps into an open ele element method. And then it's gonna take some arguments here. Uh, for open element, it's gonna take the tag name. And the first thing that we actually do here is that we push the tag name into a, a strings constants pool. The constants pool is just gonna hold on to our user-defined literals in the system. And out from that, we're gonna get a number. In this case, it's the first thing that we're pushing in, so we'll get zero uh, out of the, the constants pool. And so tag is zero at this point, and then we pass that into this builder open element. So because the VM uh, is working on these opcodes, and they're just numbers, we create an abstraction around those numbers, so almost like a DSL type of type of thing that's holding on to you know, the significant numbers in the VM this way so you're not like hard coding you know, 45, 36 all over the place. We have like an abstraction around that. And the purpose of that abstraction is just to create this linear list of numbers. And so at the end of this compilation, what, what do we get? We get a linear list of, of numbers and then we get this JSON map thing that is just the user defined literals in the system. And that's it. That's the, basically the entire process of compiling this, uh, from this declarative template language all the way to a binary format. 
So next comes actually executing this thing. Um, before we get into executing, I probably should unpack uh, what a virtual machine is. A virtual machine is a CPU written in, in software, but at the end of the day, what you can really think of it as is just a while loop with a switch statement inside of it. And every time you iterate that loop, you're pointing at an instruction that you need to execute, and then that, that opcode goes into the switch, and then the switch dis dispatches the instruction. So uh, that's probably the easiest way of explaining uh, a virtual machine. Um, so because we're dealing with binary data, we actually use the fetch API in the browser. And so we ask for the templates to come back as an array buffer, and then we just take that array buffer and we pass it into a uint16 array, which is a typed array. And that's it, that's, that's how we get the executable into the virtual machine. So this is kind of my, my visualization of what is actually going on inside of, the, uh, inside of the VM. The VM works on like an iterator type of pattern, so you drive the state forward, you're uh, iterating the internal loop by just calling next from the outside. Um, and then on the right, we kind of have a bunch of different state here. So at the top is the executable that we compiled, and below that is our constants pool. And then we have some registers here. Um, and you can think of registers as just uh, basically, you could think of them as like an object that's holding on to state that we're gonna consult as the VM is running. So we have a constructing register, and that register is gonna hold on to uh, HTML elements as we are building them. PC is program counter, or in other virtual machines, you call it an instruction pointer. And it's always just pointing at the instruction that's currently being executed. And then we have RA, which is return address. Uh, for this presentation, it's gonna stay negative one, but because the VM has components in it, uh, components are uh, modeled like function calls, so after you call into a function, you need to come, you need to know where you're going once you've done executing it. That's what that register is for, typically used for. And then we have a couple different stacks. Uh, there's an execution stack, which isn't shown here because you don't need it for this example. And then there's an element stack which is just gonna hold on to our HTML elements um, once they've been constructed. So we're gonna walk through this example step by step um, to show how we actually execute this binary format. The other thing I'll also note is that we have the code, the actual code that is being executed when we're doing this, and what you'll find is that the code is not all that much. So the first thing that we are going to execute is open element. Open element is 31, and it takes one operand, and that operand is zero. Um, in this case, zero is used to be the index into the constants pool, and so what it does is it, it pulls out the string h1, it creates uh, a HTML heading element, and places it onto the constructing register. The next step is flush element. Now, if there was actual attributes on this HTML element, there would have been more instructions between open element and flushing the element, but since there were none, uh, we immediately flushed the element from the constructing register, and we just put it onto the element stack. Next is text. Text is pretty simple. It's going to pop the element at the head of the element stack off, create a text node, append it, and then push it back onto the stack. Um, and I guess, yeah, it's 26, and one is just pointing at the, the first item inside of the constants pool, so it knows how to pick up Hello Chad. Next is close element. What close element does is it just takes the element that's at the head of the stack and appends it to the DOM. And then finally, we return. And what return does is it just sets the, the return address to the program counter, which sets it to negative one. Negative one is our way in the system to say, halt, basically halt. There is no more instructions to actually execute. And that's, that's pretty much it. That's how we take this binary format and actually turn it into a working UI. So we really think about the Glimmer VM as a declarative programming language for cr creating UIs, and the Glimmer VM is a virtual machine in bytecode format for constructing those UIs. So you may have also heard of this thing called WebAssembly, and it is, quote unquote, a bytecode for the web. So what, how does this like 
relate to the thing that you're building. Well, WebAssembly is more of like a portable binary format than it is anything really to do with the web right now. So for example, you cannot call web-based APIs inside of WebAssembly. It's really good for number crunching and doing these types of really awesome demos like porting the Unity gaming engine uh, to, to the web. But it's still pretty int interesting and it has a lot of cool properties associated with it. So some of those properties are how, it de how it's actually processed on the client. So on the top here, we have JavaScript, and JavaScript goes through a parse and compile step, and then goes through an optimization step. If the code, because JavaScript is a dynamic language, uh, you can de-opt as you're running it, so then you have to re-optimize it, and throwing away any optimized code that you, you have, it has to execute, and then you have, uh, you have to GC at certain points of time. Whereas WebAssembly, it parses and compiles directly to optimized code. It has no optimization, when you actually compile it, it compiles into the most optimized code and it cannot de-opt. Um, and that's because you, it is a compile target and you're taking languages that have static type information and you're compiling it into something that has strong guarantees around it. The other thing that, that's really great about uh, WebAssembly here is that you get, it has the ability to uh, compile faster than it is to download, so it has a, a streaming compiler uh, streaming parser and compiler, and JavaScript has this also, um, but like, like almost like the JPEG format, it's already closer to the bi binary format, so it can happen much quicker. The other thing is about WebAssembly is that it has predictable performance, and this kind of goes back to the deopt reoptimization step. Um, I'm not sure how many people saw this blog article uh, where Mozilla took the uh, source map library, converted parts of it to Rust and then compiled to WebAssembly and got some like ridiculous uh, performance benefits out of it because of the code being like highly, can be highly poly, poly, um, polymorphic. Um, now, you can write highly tuned JavaScript code to get to that same level of performance, but not everybody is a browser engineer and knows all the fast paths inside of the actual JavaScript engine. So uh, WebAssembly kind of alleviates having to know all of those details. One of the issues with uh, WebAssembly is that you typically have to write in a systems-like language, so C, C++, Rust, and then compile them to WebAssembly. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, this is not what I do in my day-to-day -day job. I'm not writing C, C++, C++ or Rust applications. So we, we kind of, it's kind of a uh, high bar to en new entrants, I think, right now. Um, but I don't think it actually has to be, or we, we can use the fact that um, we have things in, in, inside the JavaScript ecosystem where we can get the benefit without actually having to directly write uh, Rust or C++ or any of those other languages. And that's because in, within the web community, we actually have quite a few domain-specific languages already. And those domain-specific languages and the runtimes for them are already written in JavaScript. And so if we can port the, uh, the runtimes of these languages to WebAssembly, then we as uh, people that work with JavaScript there and building w things for the web can immediately get the benefit of them without actually having to uh, learn how that stuff actually works. So Earlier this year, we worked with the folks at Mozilla and um, a couple people from the Rust core team to figure out how we can utilize WebAssembly inside of the Glimmer VM. So these are kind of the, all the high level uh, components of the Glimmer VM. And what we notice is that all this stuff on the bottom, the registers, the opcodes, the stack, the heap, the constants, the execution, are all things that if we were writing a VM and for any other platform, you would probably pick a C, C++, Rust type of language. And so what we did was that we took those implementations that were written in JavaScript and we wrote them in Rust and compiled them to WebAssembly. And everything just worked. So we were able to drop that into an existing, Ember. we were able to like take this branch, build it, and then drop this version of the Glimmer VM directly into an existing Ember application, and that Ember application can run 
uh, the WebAssembly under the hood, the end consumer as you, or like the developer, the person that wrote the application has no idea that this actually occurred and you can get the benefits that are, I think now starting to really land in, inside of WebAssembly. So these are all the ways I think we're actually thinking about uh, the startup performance of applications. Um, it's a pretty tricky problem because you don't actually notice uh, like parse and compile problems when you're first building your application and your first couple features or even when you first launch your application. It's a problem that sneaks up on you over time and like uh, we, we d don't do a very good job at testing the whole array of devices for making sure that our JavaScript startup performance is always uh, top notch. So hopefully today I showed that we actually have the technology to help mitigate a lot of these problems. We just have to think, uh, I think, a little bit different about how we're approaching uh, our problems and just in development in general. So that's it, thanks. <laughs>